So I had a boss uh, when I was uh, wet behind the ears who, who uh, said, you know, when you're speaking, there's a contract between speaker and audience, all right? The, the speaker's job is to talk and to express things and to provide food for thought. The audience's job is to listen and evaluate. And he said, you just need to hope that you finish your job before they finish theirs. <laughs> So, to be fully disclosing, <clears throat> I'm, I'm an engineer by profession. And uh, when, when I speak, I want to make sure that people know what I'm going to say, and then I'll say it, and I'll tell them I said it. And so, um, that's what this is for. This is my point for the sermon. Uh, that, in fact, I want to make sure I can actually get the, the mouse to work. Uh, so, two engineering OCDs are taken care of here. Um, this is the point. It's not a three-point sermon, it's just one. Jesus meets us the way we are. Got it? Okay, so if I bail right now, we can say we're done. It'd be a short sermon, we can head on to the coffee hour. Let's do the offering first. Okay, offering, right, offering and then the coffee hour. <laughs> so, anyway, so uh, that's the point. The, uh, so on to communion shoes. Um, how do those communion shoes get together? Well, it's not communion Sunday, but that's okay. I'm gonna use communion as the leading point for why shoes are important when it comes to thinking about how we relate to God. So um, at communion, I tend to be reflective, you know, looking down and prayerful. Um, a few years back, I was sitting over there, and I noticed people as they were lining up to take uh, the communion elements, <clears throat> the bread and the, the, uh, the, the wine. The wine. Um, and I was thinking about my condition and, uh, you know, what, what I was going through, and um, I started noticing people's shoes as, as they were walking down. Now, I, I don't have a shoe fixation, <clears throat> so at the next communion, don't worry about me and your shoes, please. Um, just, you know, just carry on as you would. But um, I, I noticed the variety of shoes that I started seeing, and I thought to myself how that illustrated my own different ways of how I felt when I approached Jesus. There were people with spiffy shoes, shined, nice, nice shoes, who were ready to go, approaching Jesus head on, you know, ready for you, Christ. Then there were some folks with uh, scruffier shoes, and, you know, I thought, well, you know, that's me when there's wear and tear. And then there were barefoot people who were just going as they were. And uh, then people wearing sort of normal, everyday shoes that just, you know, I'm trying to do what I can do. And, and for me, that drove home the analogy of how we approach Jesus in so many different ways. And I also thought, well, okay, so the people doing elements, they're not going to turn you away because they don't like your foot, right? If, if you don't have uh, wingtips on, they're probably going to let you, you know, take, partake the elements anyway. Um, and likewise, Jesus isn't going to turn us away if we're not perfect, if we're not right for being able to talk with him, if we're sort of hesitant, if we're, you know, busy thinking about other, about other things. So um, that's, uh, you know, that's something that it, it really struck me, the shoe versus relationship with Jesus analogy. We don't have to be holy, we just have to be kind of here. And even if we're not here, Jesus is ready to come to see us. So, um, you know, you, you, you may be asking yourself, uh, how can uh, you know, Jesus meet me? How can I be ready to meet Jesus? Um, and so, in order to understand how Jesus relates to us, let's, um, let's begin to look at some of what the Bible says about <coughs> Christ's relationships and how he had relationships uh, as, it, as it talks about it in the New Testament. Now, there, there are a lot of, a lot of good uh, texts that talk about uh, you know, Christ and his relationship to people. And I've, I've picked three here. These are three that are easily in the top ten, at least for me, that, uh, that I enjoy, that really speak to me. And we're, gonna, we're not going to take a deep look, although every one of these three deserves some serious contemplation. We're, we're going to look at each one as an example for how Jesus related to the people involved. So um, we'll see that there are you know, three different uh, people and three very different uh, conditions. And that uh, Jesus uh, you know, met them individually uh, the way he intended. So um, let's start the shoe analogy with. Uh, uh, 
uh, ooh, ooh, sorry. Okay. With, uh, with the, the spiffy chair, the shoes, the shiny shoes, the wingtips. Um, we're going to talk here about uh, the Centurion. Now, uh, what better day than on Veterans Day to talk about a military man of faith? Um, the Centurion here is a really interesting guy. You know, you, you could look at these set of verses and say, oh, it's Jesus doing a miracle. Yeah. <coughs> But, but there's so much more here. This is a very rich story. I, I, you know, I suggest that for each one of the three, you, uh, you know, spend some time on your own kind of looking. But this is a very rich story of, uh, of a man of faith. Not, I mean, yeah, there's a miracle there, an important one. But I think the message here that's really important is the faith message and uh, the relationship message. So um, let's, let's read through these, and I'll, I'll do the reading if that's OK, uh, from the uh, New Living Testament. At that time, the highly valued slave of a Roman officer was sick and near death. When the officer heard about Jesus, he sent some respected Jewish elders to ask him to come heal his slave. So they earnestly, that's the leaders, earnestly begged Jesus to help the man. If anyone deserves your help, he does, they said, for he loves the Jewish people and, and even built a synagogue for us. So Jesus went with him. A, a little pause here. Um, Roman officer, this guy was important. He was part of an occupation army. Um, he was a Roman in Jewish territory. These people were being occupied by this guy. He's really pretty important. He was probably a colonel, maybe a brigadier general, so somebody of significance who would outrank uh, Craig Kasuchi. <laughs> um, somebody of importance. I mean, not Craig is important, so this guy's really important. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, he's not somebody you'd think that they would like. So he has Jewish elders who are fronting for him to Jesus. You know, just, you know, there, there's a lot of depth here that's, uh, that's really interesting. So, you know, he's a bad guy from everybody else's point of view, but clearly um, he, uh, he's a man of God because he got respective elders to speak for him. Um, so, uh, for he loves to do it. So Jesus went with them. They, they, they talked to Jesus. Jesus uh, uh, was convinced. Uh, but just before they arrived at the house, the officer sent some friends to say, Lord, don't trouble yourself by coming to my, oops, to my home, for I am not worthy of such an honor. I am not even worthy to come and meet you. Just say the word from where you are, and my servant will be healed. So, the guy doesn't come to meet Jesus. The guy sends more word to Jesus, telling Jesus that he wasn't worthy to even meet, but he acknowledges Christ's power to be able to heal his servant. Okay. He says, I know this because I am under the authority of my superior officers, and I have authority over my shoulders. I only need to say go, and they go, or come, and they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. So what's the guy saying to Jesus? He's saying, I recognize your authority and your power because I understand authority and power. I wield it. So this guy, who's a colonel or a general, commanding a, a lot of people in an occupation situation, probably a large area with a, not just administrivia, but you know, worrying about troublemakers and all that kind of this guy who knows authority recognizes authority in Jesus. At the level that he says he doesn't deserve to be in the social media. So that would make Jesus what? Two stars, three stars. Um, you only need to say go and then go. He understands authority. So when Jesus heard this, he was amazed. How many people amazed Jesus this morning? Did you? Anybody? I, I did. Um, this is the only time Jesus was amazed in the New Testament in a positive way. The only time a Roman officer who had faith amazed Jesus. Wow. So, turning to the crowd he said, uh, that was following him, he said, I tell you, I haven't seen faith like this in all Israel, this Roman usurper, you know. 
And when the officer's friends returned to his house, they found the slave completely dead. That's an amazing story. Now, how did this guy meet Jesus? Well, he actually didn't meet Jesus. Hmm. But he was so well prepared and so understanding and so in, in so much um, faith that Jesus recognized that and said, okay, your servant's healed. So this guy was ready. He was prepared. And Jesus was ready to work with him. Now, I'd like to say that I'm like this, uh, but that's not true. So um, if that pair of shoes isn't you, and it's definitely not me, maybe the next pair of shoes will, uh, will uh, be more like uh, who you and I are today. OK, so for this one, we're, uh, we're going to look at uh, boots, um, you know, mud boots. Uh, and we're going to uh, look at the story of the Samaritan woman. Again, something people know fairly well. But uh, let's look at her and her relationship and uh, the condition she was in as she was talking to Jesus. <coughs> Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily, wearily beside the well about noontime, the middle of the day. Soon, a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was, at the lone, he was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. All right, so middle of the day uh, in Samaria, she's going to say, he, you know, that she was surprised. For Jews refuse to have anything to do with Samaritans. Uh, you're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? So, number one, Jesus isn't where he's supposed to be. Samaritans were unclean. Samaria was unclean. It was a garbage dump. <laughs> and uh, he was there. That's number one. Number two, the woman was uh, going to get water at noontime. She should have gone to get water in the morning. Why was she going at noontime? Because she was ashamed of people seeing her. So she had intended to go get water quietly just get it, take it home, at a time of day when she would be shamed. She was totally unexpecting Jesus to be there. She was just going about her everyday drudge, taking care of business, trying to avoid trouble, trying to avoid the shame and ridicule of her community. And Jesus was there, surprised. So Jesus says, Later on, Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water, then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. So Jesus makes an offer for water that she really can't refuse. Did she come there that day expecting that? No. This was a total surprise. She was just taking care of business, trying to stay out of trouble. So Jesus says, go get your husband. And she says, I don't have a husband. Um, Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. She said, you certainly spoke the truth, sir. You must be a prophet. So not only does he surprise her for being there, make her this wonderful offer of redemption that she's totally unexpected, but she acknowledges him as being a prophet. So this is a situation where she, she wasn't, didn't want an interaction with anybody. Yet Jesus was there to surprise her and to provide her with a redemptive opportunity to show his love, to show his grace in a situation that was totally surprising for him. And the woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called the Christ. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. And Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Jesus declares himself not to a leader, not to somebody of great importance, but to this woman who's an outcast. He declares herself, himself the Messiah so that she can know who he is and why he's there and to understand better the surprise of grace and love that he provides her. 
a very different picture from the wingtip guy. So if you uh, if you uh, you know aren't uh, wingtips or mud boots, uh, let's try this. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. Sorry, sorry. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna do Zacchaeus now. Um, Zacchaeus has running shoes on. We'll see. Uh, we'll see why. There was a man named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but was too short sorry, uh, to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road where Jesus was uh, going to pass by. So Zacchaeus was a Jewish man who had to be short. Um, he was a tax collector. He was an anathema to the Jewish community. He was a flunky to the Romans. He was a pariah. Nobody liked him. And, and you know, the Romans put up with him. He was a tool for them. The Jewish folks hated him. Tax collectors were the lowest of the low. And so um, Zacchaeus, he's there, but he doesn't really want to be seen. And so he's ready to bolt whenever he needs to, just in case somebody sees him. But Jesus came by, and he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased, those displeased people. He's gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half of my wealth to the poor Lord, and if I've cheated people on their taxes, I'll give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham, this outcast, this Jewish traitor, has been a true son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. So our friend Zacchaeus, he's frightened. He uh, tries to stay hidden. He's up in a tree. He's ready to run. But Jesus goes, hey, not so fast. Uh, not only does Jesus acknowledge him, but Jesus invites himself to lunch at a place where he really shouldn't go. You know, so this is place two where he shouldn't really go. In fact, the Roman guy, he really shouldn't associate with any of these people. Um, so he's associated with them, he's associated with us. Um, so Zacchaeus not only is just trying to stay distant, but there because he wants to see Jesus. But he's afraid of the, the whole encounter. Jesus grabs onto him and befriends him and goes to his home so he can eat and break bread. So that's another kind of surprise. It wasn't something that Zacchaeus was expecting. But at least Zacchaeus was expecting to see Jesus, unlike the Samaritan woman. Um, so, uh, there are lots of other examples of Jesus relating to people in the New Testament. And, um, you know, we, we see three examples here. Somebody up front, ready to go. Somebody totally not expecting. In fact, not even wanting anybody to see them. And then Zacchaeus is so tentative that he's ready to run at a moment's notice. So, what I'd like to do is um, for, for us to spend a minute to think about what kind of shoes are we wearing today? You know, what condition are we in today? Um, are you Mr. Wingtip or Miss Prada? You're dressed up, sharp, and ready to go. Meet Jesus head on um, so that he and you can do what you need to do. Are you uh, bogged down in mud boots, just drudging along, getting what you need to get done, done? really don't want to deal with this Jesus guy. I hadn't expected him to actually show up. Um, are you frightened? Are you ready to run? Uh, like say, our friends at PS1. Or do you have plain old shoes like my uh, New Balance 411 is the best walking shoe on the planet? Um, so what kind of shoe? And if your shoe matches your shoe, then you get extra points. But if it doesn't, what kind of shoe do you have? So I want you to look at this and consider it I'm going to give you a few minutes. I'm going to stand here and I'm going to hum the thing to Jeopardy while you think about which shoe is yours. <coughs> Okay, 
So now that you've thought about that, um, and where you are in relationship to Jesus, whether you're, you know, wingtipped or barefoot, what I'd like to do is to, uh, to offer a challenge to each one of us today. Uh, if you are Mr. Wingtip, Miss Prada, and you're in really great shape, I'm going to suggest that you spend some extra time in prayer today. And I'm going to suggest that you pray that God shows you someone who is seeking Jesus, that you can help in that search for Christ. If you're uh, bogged down in, in mud boots, I'm going to suggest that you spend some time in prayer that's focused on God, asking God something like, God, give me peace, give me wisdom, give me strength to find what you want from me. If you're uh, frightened with your running shoes on, then I'm going to invite you to spend some quiet time with God so that you can quietly ask what God's guidance <coughs> for you today is. And if uh, you really don't know who this Jesus guy is at all, then uh, I'm going to suggest you talk to either Todd or Mark, um, and he'll, he'll give you an introduction. Uh, one of them, or both, will give you an introduction to who this Jesus guy is. So think about that. Spend an extra moment or two in prayer, depending on where you are. And I'd like to leave us with one last thought, if I could. Um, just imagine, just suppose that you really took to heart the fact that Jesus wants to meet you where you are. If you really accepted that, how much more assurance would there be in our lives if we were that way? How much more encouraged would we be if we accepted the fact that Jesus really wants to meet us where we are. Because, you know, he really, really does. But we need to accept. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for, so much for this beautiful day. Thank you for the uh, opportunity to look at your word. Thank you for the examples on this Veterans Day of uh, a military man with faith and a woman at the well and so Father, they may not be exactly what we are, but we can understand from their examples the kinds of ways you relate to us, whether we're ready or not. Help us to acknowledge that and to grow with that. And thank you so much for being the kind of Christ that you are to come to us as we need. These things we ask in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.